run a space in, um, in Basel with uh, three friends called New Jersey. And, um, and back then, uh, we, it was exactly the same time uh, during Art Basel. And we invited Ida to do uh, a show in our small, tiny space. But the one thing uh, that we were a bit annoyed by uh, is was, yeah, how can we pull, pull up, uh, do a show, and so that we don't have to be in the space? Because obviously, it's, you know, it was Art Basel time, and we wanted to go out and doing party, not sitting in a, uh, in a gallery. So we talked to Ida, and then Ida said, you know what we could do, which is, I just paint. So we had two big windows. Uh, so I just paint these two windows, we do an opening party, then we close the door and we never go back again. <laughs> but the, uh, this way, like all the people who wanted to see the show, they could go any time, day and night, because the show was always open, because it was uh, uh, the window, uh, um, um, uh, the painting on the window. So at the end of the show, we just took knives out and took all the painting down and everything uh, was gone. And I think there, there were a couple of a uh, couple of um, elements in, in that show that are also present in here. For instance, a very, you know, a very uh, relaxed and distant uh, way of dealing with her own work, but also a very serious and committed way uh, to, to get engaged with the space, with, uh, with people, with us uh, back then. But my first question, so I would like to go, maybe in the first part, a bit a lot, no more, asking you more about, you know, all these other things you did with, um, back in the time to Oslo. And then in the second part, I would like to, to move uh, more into the show and maybe talk about uh, a few works here. Since this is this uh, very rare occasion when you can do a talk, in the space with the artworks itself, so you don't have to project all these <coughs> flat JPEGs on the wall. So, Ida. So, the question behind this is obviously, um, you know, how, do you, the, how did you get into art? Where does it come from? You, you once said that uh, it started with doing things with maybe graffiti. Uh, how did that? How did that go? Can you say something about? Yeah. You getting into visual material, into getting paint in your hands? Mm, yeah, I, I actually, it sounds a bit cliche, but I, I think it was through graffiti in Oslo. And then I started to look at artists like Basquiat, just naturally, because that was an artist that had done graffiti when he was younger. And from then on, it's kind of, yeah, the interest grew and I kind of moved away from but were you part of a graffiti crew? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, and what so was your name? Uh, one of them was uh, Peel or Bua, which is bow and arrow. <laughs> and, yeah, it's not. But it's so a long name, Peel or Bua. Really. Yeah. And um, and was it mainly were you the only girl back then in the group? Mm, no, there was a few girls, like three girls maybe. And then they all become artists? Uh, no. What happened to them? Uh, one is a professional skier, I think. And uh, the other one is a drug addict. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened to the girls in the group? Yeah, that, that's what happened oh, to them. <laughs> uh, and, the, and the boys you don't remember? No. <laughs> some of them still, right, actually? So, some yeah, still are still active. Yeah. So um, you once said that this uh, this um, you know sk skate graffiti milieu was a, a very manly or man run culture. How did you react to that? How was that? Would you talk about these things? Mm, not so much back then, actually. Um, I I was attracted to other girls. That I also break danced when I was younger. <laughs> And there was also, I was in a breakdance crew with girls called Female Force. <laughs> I haven't Female talked Force. about this in 20 years. Yeah, but I was attracted to, I don't know, girls doing graffiti or girls. There was like a little group of girls that 
I hung out with. And that's, that was before you then enter into doing exhibitions and yeah. So, yeah. so how much in between is, was that like, uh, uh, you would be part of this graffiti crews and then started to do shows or? Um, yeah, I think I started to do, I would go, there was a bus garage in Oslo that you could kind of climb some ladders. You could base, there was murals everywhere, but you couldn't, you could kind of stay there for a long time and paint instead of, you know, the normal procedure where you paint and then you run. Yes. And there was a whole summer where I kind of went up and just painted murals everywhere on the roof of that building. And then I had more time and that's maybe what yeah, drew me to, to want to paint more. Mm. And then, and, and it would stay up there with your friends. It wasn't just a lonely yeah. thing. It was yeah. with cook, all cook uh, food and like a, you know, like the kitchen. Barbecuing. Where you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, then, and then from there, um, you decided to, to, to go into art school. Yeah. I, so a, I know that I, I kind of knew that I wanted to do that, but I, yeah, then I applied to Central St. Martins. So I went there. So you moved to London? Yeah. And then back to Oslo? To the, yeah, then I moved back to Oslo and went to the Art Academy. And then the first spaces with uh, like exactly Willy Wonka, that was during your Oslo studies? Yeah. And why did you do an exhibition space? Um, I don't know. It was a really humongous and cool and dusty, strange space. and. There was so much room, so the show became, I don't know, huge because <laughs> we had to fill it. And then I had some friends abroad, and I don't know, the ball just started rolling, and then we did different things there. And how many shows did you do? Not so many. We also did shows other places and kind of in our apartments. And, and then there was a second, uh, there was a second, I don't know if it is an exhibition space, but the, the Institute for uh, Degenerate, degenerate yeah, yeah. Art. That wasn't so much me, actually. It was more my friends, but I was involved in it as well. So it's kind of a, yeah. And that, that was uh, uh, the, the same guys as, as Willy Wonka? It was the same yeah, scene? Yeah, sort of the same people. Uh -huh. yeah. And there was on Natasha, which was another space. And it's all like Oslo <laughs> local underground spaces from the Yeah, so I remember then that um, in, in, in Cologne there was this um, uh, dark fair. So during Art Cologne, it's probably also 10 years ago, you had these two guys from uh, New York, the Reader Brothers, they organized a, a so-called dark fair. So you, uh, you would take a booth, but you were not allowed to use any electric, electric light. So it was dark. So you had to go maybe with a you know lighter or uh, or some kind of lamp. And I remember. So we had a, a, a space up there as well. And <laughs> next to us was uh, I think it was the institute for. I don't. I don't think it was or like yeah yeah. Where was it? I can't maybe. remember. We were a group of people. Which structure yeah. it was? Yeah. So there's Ida and uh, a few guys and. All of a sudden, they disappear. Nothing happens, and we nicely <laughs> install things. All of a sudden, they all come back with, uh, uh, you know, shopping trolleys full of trash, and they started to build this amazing exhib exhibition of just uh, 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 things that they had found. So, um, you know, this. Just picking up things in the street, is that uh, something you still do? Or what is your relationship to that? I, st I still do, but there's a funny, because through graf that, that we ended up finding that stuff, is actually that we, we didn't know what to do. We took the tram like far out into the suburb to very, like, look like a very fancy neighborhood. And then all of a sudden when we're on the tram, we see like a piece, a throw up on a very beautiful stone, grand house, like a f in a very fancy neighborhood. And then that's so strange to see a throw up in an area like that. The throw up is like a quick graffiti yeah. sketch, like huge. So, okay, so the house must be abandoned because otherwise you would never... Uh, have, to, have to grab it. Yeah, so we, so we found this house by chance. It was a squat, but it was nobody there. And floors and floors that were so magical, like completely a house that had been abandoned with like bookshelves that had kind of melted. 
and all kinds of strange, you know, remnants and leftovers from so many people that had partied there and, you know, made uh, fireplaces and weird places and a toilet in the stairs. So that's where we found all that. And I remember the guy's name because we went through stuff there and I think it was Hubert Mockenstorf or something. So the show was like, I think it was called something. Yeah. So it was all from this place. And are you still, for your work, are you still going, do you still do things like this? That you go like pick up stuff in the Some, street? Yeah, I do. And I just, I had a show at Tamayo in Mexico City and I did three pieces with more like picked up stuff, outdoor sculptures. And what do you do exactly? Um, it all depends, but I cast it sometimes into so I wet concrete and I find objects and then it's kind of, I make the sculpture and you know, 20 minutes or 30 minutes or so. Yeah. Uh, so these are the ones in the buckets, like, and then you stick things yeah. into it. I mean, during, I, I started to use trolleys because uh, the sculptures were so heavy to carry because the concrete is so heavy. So I could take a box on a trolley, like a shopping trolley or whatever trolley, with an empty box and then pour salmon and water whilst I was walking. And like during, you know, ah, like when I was during at collecting. the Brooklyn Navy Yard with a trolley and a box with wet cement, and then I can climb into, you know, there's like all these theater productions there, so they throw strange things, or at Rockaway Beach, you can find a lot of strange material, and yeah, then yeah. it's kind of the sculpture is being made in 30 minutes or something, because the concrete dries quickly, so you have to make decisions very fast. Like when you do graffiti. Yes. You have to be very fast. <laughs> <laughs> so, so did then once you moved more into uh, uh, like proper art world context, did you immediately uh, do all these different things at the same time, or would you just start with painting and then discovering sculpture, or how did that uh, develop? It was kind of simultaneous. I was interested in both, I think, and um, I was also, when I was younger, I kind of made my own clothes and clothes to, you know, with friends and stuff like that, and I discovered this, like, screen printing material, and I also remember that I realized, you know, it's the same stuff that I have in all the paintings here, but I also realized it was sculptural, so I made little tiny sculptures with it, like, objects with that same material, yeah. Yeah, maybe you have to explain yeah. the material. Yeah. Um, so all of these paintings are made with a mixture. It's like an industrial component for screen printing and kind of t-shirt or whatever. It's the textile industries. And it's not really meant for uh, painting. And then I add a, it's kind of a, another component that Fujifilm makes, which I call it puff. I'm not sure. That's the name, and these two together, when you bake them, you get like a puffy surface. It's almost like it's mushrooming up when you bake it at like, I don't know, 300 degrees with an industrial heater or something. So it's kind of my own uh, material or, yeah. And I, it's maybe, it's how I often find, like how I, when I paint, I try to make my own materials to paint with, so it's something kind of, you know, like a brew that I do in my studio. So it's, um, um, maybe you remember in the 80s, this um, sweater with this uh, prints and they were a little bit uh, thicker. So that's the exact material. But the thing about that material is that it never dries. Uh, and then how do you get it dry? Yeah, you, it's very good that it never dries because then you can never, you never have to put the lid on. And to, when you paint, it's always, if you work with other materials or if you worked with, uh, let's say acrylics, you know, you have to make sure you have to put on the lids. But I mix so many colors. I have the luxury of having like 3,000 different colors lying around on different, you know, boxes so you can in my mix studio. Them. You mix it and you can always leave it. And I can, you know, like some kind of olive green that I mixed a year ago, I can still use it today. So it, uh, it's practically, it works really well for me because I'm too sloppy to always put on the lids on everything, you know, but then, you know, you destroy your material. So you heat it with an industrial gun. With a fan. Like a bigger fan. And you, uh -huh. yeah, listen to music, and you 
could meditate. So one could wash them now? Yes. Technically. Really. <laughs> I, you can because I've also used it on t-shirts sometimes. And I wash them and it sticks. So what is the other advantage of, uh, or is there any advantage of this uh, kind of uh, color? That you like about you know yeah, it's not it's, oil it's not acrylic it's something else what it's do something you so strange I, it's so dry and so strange and I, it's not so easy to understand what it is i think it's very it's sculptural it's also heavy to work with it makes you very you know a bit clumsy when you paint and i i, I like that kind of choppy clumsy thick some yeah, um surface so the last year, I, two years, I almost, you know, it's almost, almost been the only material I've used when I'm painting. Mm. So, uh, something you, uh, what you see here is uh, in so far very special as all these paintings have been painted individually. And then uh, Ida decided to combine them like a collage. And it's something I've never seen. Uh, I mean, I'm around in the art world side 30 years. I have never seen an artist doing paintings and then just collaging them together. Uh, and, and eventually what it also means is they could disassemble. So, um, for instance, this big painting over here, after the show, it's quite possible it falls apart and is, uh, it, so it has only this form for the exhibition. How did you <laughs> have this idea? Well, <laughs> Why did it, where did this idea come from? To put paintings together? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 it's gradually happened because I've, well, I've done panels and murals together before and then, and then uh, I like that and, and, and somehow I thought it's also cool if, if I make shapes and they don't fit perfectly and also, I don't know, it's cool to, to kind of have different components that don't really fit and try to just like force them together in the frame so it's kind of paintings that are just forced to, 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 to deal with each other. Yeah. Yeah. And they, uh, um, talking about forcing, you also, uh, the other question I had, so downstairs probably you have all seen this scorpion with this, uh, what is it called in English? The, the, the bellow? Bellow, bellow, yeah, the bellow, yeah. yeah. So how, you know, how did that, <laughs> where did that come from? Um, I can trace that back to um, the fact that I had made the other works in, in cast iron. Um, the black iron works are made in this uh, iron, old iron factory in Norway that used to make ovens, you know, like the stoves of, to heat cottages and and houses back in the day, the kind of paneled iron ovens. And I watched a video about hand casting iron, uh, which was really like quite beautiful, uh, just a video to show like how the workers made casted works. And they used a bellow to blow away extra sand from the sand casts. And uh, that made me start to think about a sculpture with a bow. Yeah, it's Maybe not she... always that I know why I, but I actually do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, the benches up here are also casted in at Ulefoss, and now they they only do uh, what I know to be called manholes, which are like the those iron covers for the sewing system under the city um, because they kind of had to change the business because otherwise they would be out of business because nobody buys those ovens anymore. But they, sometimes they do a street bench, kind of a quite simple one, but they have, the, they have a history of also doing kind of what you call the goods in Norway, which is like, you know, some street benches or like huge pots for flowers or something like that. And I wanted to do a, my own, like a bench, I, yeah. Um, so just before we talk about the bench, can you say something about the technique with the sand? How exactly is it done? 
Um, it's like these, uh, it's super complicated. I'm not even understand. sure I understand it, but they have a, um, kind of huge cases with sand and they do like a negative and then they pour in the iron and they have to, I don't know, it also, it's like so hot, they have to leave it. So these benches were hard for them to make because they could only make one a night or something and they, their capacity wasn't so and it has to kind of cool down in this shape. Yeah. And can you say something about, so the, the I think it was a early decision for the show to have uh, these big paintings and then uh, and then uh, to to bring these benches in. So there's something also that you see in Ida's work is you have you have things that are, that have multiple functions. So the bench is obviously a, a very strange sculpture, but it's also something you can just sit on. So it's a bit like the as I said at the beginning, uh, doing a painting on the on the window, and then also why not just take it down and it is uh, gone. So there is a, there is a sense of um, yeah, focusing, but also a sense of letting things, uh, letting things go or, or giving things over to other people as uh, you do when you run uh, yeah. a space or a record label. You hand it over to other people, right? Yeah. Yep. So, um, can you say so something about the, the animal, the motif, the kraken? Yeah. Uh... So on the benches, sorry. On the benches you have this... Uh, Octopus uh, and is uh, or kraken in uh, Norway. Yeah, uh, call them kraken mobile. <laughs> there, that's I mean that's kind of a um, f f like a fable. Like, um, it has the history of being this creature uh, that took down ships. So it took you know the scary creature that would take the sailors from the sea, and it's kind of this like dragging some, dragging the floating ship under. <laughs> underwater and killing and somehow I wanted to have a, some marble that could be very pre like pretentious, a preto thing to put a bench in front of your painting. It's like so <laughs> very awful gesture. <laughs> I, I also wanted to kind of draw to have a link to the downstairs work in Iran and also maybe a gesture that it also I have this little creature that might, you know, show my ambivalence also even about kind of pasting these humongous works and yeah, so it functions as a, I don't know, an ambivalent kind of portal work, I don't know. I mean, it makes it a bit more everyday. Yeah. Uh, you know, these paintings in big spaces is always uh, uh, very impressive and intimidating and a bit church-like or maybe more like a, a museum or a bank. So uh, having these uh, benches in front of a, uh, of a painting makes him a bit like, yeah, well, yeah, so have a seat and have a look and then may, you may uh, leave uh, again. So I think there's also something very important that I, um, I was interested in is this interest for, um, or this um, capacity of Ida to, to, uh, to, gra to, to expose herself to the everyday. It's just something that constantly comes uh, com comes back as, uh, and you think you, you you have to know that, or you probably know that the everyday. So in German, it's the Alltag. The everyday is is a very difficult thing. It's it's something very nice, but also extremely brutal because ne the everyday is a monster. It eats everything. You can do whatever you want. In the end, the everyday life will go over it, and things will just move on. Whatever ha happens. So I was always uh, so there is this idea of bringing that, uh, well, what, how could we call it, that disaster, that catastrophe, or that uh, tragedy, uh, which is also a comedy, or maybe the other way around, uh, into, into uh, the work. And then I was wondering, so is that like a national animal, the, 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 the kraken, kind of? In is Norway? It, yeah, is it part of like national mythology? No, it's part of the yeah, mythology yeah. of like, you know, there's a lot of writing about it also in terms of like, you know, sailing because Norway is a country by the fjord and yeah. So you can find nice, like enormous amounts of good pictures oh. of this kraken. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we don't have that. It would be mm -hmm. the cows for us, but that's mm -hmm. not a very interesting uh, 
but the thing, so a friend just told me that the croc and they have brains in each uh, arm. So it's like a multi-brain uh, uh, creature and it is uh, very, very interesting uh, as something to be uh, developed. So um, when we talked about the, when we talked about the show, um, we were wondering how we could bring all these different worlds together. So that's why we decided uh, to, to have somehow three chapters. So it starts with a shop, which is also the everyday experience now of a museum. You know, that the museums, you, you wonder if the, sh the exhibition is here for the shop or uh, the other way around. So uh, uh, we just thought, okay, let's do, uh, let's start with uh, the shop and the merchandising is part of uh, uh, the art world very much now. Uh, and then it goes over into a very different mood and, and either um, <laughs> asks us not to put on any light. So what you have downstairs is a very unique situation, not only for the first time ever in the history of Constable Zurich, you see the whole window, all the, you know, the base, uh, but also it's, it's a space where the light is uh, changing from minute to minute. So maybe, why, why so? Why did you want to have that? Mm, um, I think I wanted the space to be stripped, to kind of, because when I realized I could ask for that, it was kind of to make, like, we talked, like, almost make a rib cage, like a very, like, stripped space. And a, a lot of the sculptures that I worked with for the last year, I was interested in this process of almost, like, stopping to do bronze works, but to do them very raw and very kind of show the process of how the, the metal runs into the, the sculpture and it almost yeah. makes skeletons of the works and or like nerve threads or yeah you kind of see this like weird organic way that they're they're made which you usually would chase away and you would polish it and it would have this beautiful object and um i there's a kind of sober melody maybe like a di completely different type of energy than this room and i and i thought that the if we have no lightning then the natural light coming through the windows, it changes the sculptures, like you say, when it's sunny, they're gleaming more and look, you know, sparkly, and then there it's like a more, I don't know, it's, it's a heavier space, it's more black metal, kind of, yeah. Um, yeah, and I just think the works look also so much better with natural light. They do, and, and especially so during the opening around nine, 9.30 gets very, it starts to get very dark, but it gets more and more uh, beautiful. So the last, uh, there was also the very last work you see in that space against, you know, these things that are against the wall. Um, that was also something that uh, was uh, surprising or, or, or uh, uh, good to have is, Okay, these metal plates arrived uh, two days before the opening and, and we s you still had to figure out what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So what we see down there, is it, is it true that uh, the way it looks to me, it's, it's just starting? Yeah, I have uh, this kind of raw material which I want to <laughs> I wanna continue because, you, I mean, you can build with it and it's, you know, the, the plates are the are same kind of type of, uh, they're made in the same way that they used to make the plates for to build the ovens. So they're kind of building bricks and material. And um, I, I mean, I only just started to work with this cast metal. And so I guess I'm going to use that material to make something else next time. And I, you know, I, I always, I like to have some unresolved uh, business <laughs> uh, during install. And it kind of makes me think in a different way when I install, and then you have a lot of possibilities that you can use, or just, I don't know, you have the possibility of destroying <laughs> the possibilities. Or yeah, and it, uh, it reminds us also that, you know, what we expect from exhibition is to have a finished thing. Uh, you don't want to go see a Picasso exhibition that is not finished. So there's a very in our minds deeply set the expectation that 
an exhibition the day of the opening, it is finished, yeah. But with a work like this, it also reminds us that it doesn't have to be finished. You know, these exhibitions are just places where people try out things. This idea of a finished exhibition, it's, I don't know where it comes from, it, uh, wherever it comes from, but I don't think it's always a very good idea to think about an exhibition as a finished thing. So I think that's uh, uh, these, these bits and parts that you have uh, present here in a work that expands in so many uh, different directions. And that was, especially for me then as a curator or art historian, it's something that is extremely exciting because I can think a lot of things about it. So that's, uh, that's an art that, in, uh, that inspires me. And uh, so should we, maybe should we have some questions? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I would say, let's leave it here for the moment. There is, um, as you can see, we could go on for a long time. But I also thought maybe you, somebody here has an urgent question and would like to uh, ask Ida, uh, about it. And if so, please raise your hand because then I would bring you uh, the microphone. Could you, ask, could you tell us something about the coins, the medals? The coins, yeah. Um, I had a period of time where I could be alone in a workshop in this uh, metal, this bronze uh, factory in Berlin, and I did, didn't have any plan, so. I went there and I made whatever came from my mind, and it wasn't um, it wasn't a, 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 a huge plan behind it. It was I'd seen uh, I'd painted some medicine bottles with a with the writing of this theriac, on, which is written on the coin, and uh, read a little bit about that. That this theriac is this ancient medicine and antidote, a cure for everything, and. And I started to make the coins and I wanted, suddenly I wanted to have the coins as heads and then they became like a, a kind of a recurring object within this body of work. Um, and I don't, it's, it's very often I work like that. It's kind of, I see what's in me at the moment when I'm working. It's, I don't generally do like really, you know, detailed plans of, what to, what to make? Yeah. Um. <laughs> okay, I researched all these words because I was also wondering uh, uh, what it means. So, and then I, you know, I started to, to build my own, own understanding of it. So elect is, you know, elect, you know, choose something. And then the teriyak is a cure for everything. And then the... I don't know how you pronounce it, diates. No. <laughs> diates. So that's something um, in medicine which describes um, a tendency of your body towards something. So if, if you have an allergy, your body tends towards this uh, uh, thing. So, so, um, so it's, it's choose, choose an antidote or uh, a cure everything for what your tendency, what you you have in your body towards something. That's what it means. But there's a second meaning, uh, which I also like a lot. So, um, diates is also a, uh, a cat in, it's used in linguistics. So it's a category of a word, uh, of a verb. So you have passive and active, let's say. Had, and I always say these examples, yeah. Um, George buys a house for uh, Ida. A house is bought by George for Ida. So what the verb does in this construction, it distributes the roles between the agents. Um, and that's just, uh, and there are very tiny, you know, there is tiny details, but they are very important because they regulate, for instance, uh, the power relationship between the agent in the, in the, in the sentence. So uh, what I really love about all this is that that it's basically, it's, it describes the role of art. Art is exactly, uh, for me at least, elect um, teriyaktiates, because art is a thing that uh, controls the way, for instance, that we sit here, 
is already exactly this. You know, it controls the way you, you stand in a space, the, 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 the way you watch, you look at something, the way maybe I turn myself to uh, Ida now. So this, it, 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 um, it distributes the roles between uh, uh, the people. And I think that's the power, one of the important power of art. And I know everybody thinks I'm romantic. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it is. Any other question? If, aha, uh -huh. Thomas, you want the microphone? If I look at these uh, wonderful paintings, I uh, see some link to some elements of pop art or uh, folk art or um, uh, here I heard it's a blanket. Sorry? Uh, I heard here it's a blanket from my wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what's your attitude towards history and, and uh, you, you are actively searching or it, it, it falls into places or? It's hard to say one sentence about that. Do you mean uh, how, how they're, con like how I collect or gather my inspirations or how they're made or if I look at... Yeah, when you make a painting, do you actively search for elements uh, in, in history or, or uh, it, it just develops out of your body of knowledge that you have in your brain somewhere? The last maybe, but that sounds very... <laughs> then I sound strange, but I... I, I, I'm a collector in the way that I always, I, 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 I don't know, I, there's so many elements of, like, the, I, the paintings are collected often of, like, little things of images that I say, they're strange, and I turn it around, and I sketch, and I take away something, and it's, it's a bit, I guess that's super cliche, but for me, a lot of my inspiration comes from music, and kind of, uh, producers and DJs and labels like trilogy tapes in London or and um, that way of like we had Joy Orbison played here for me in the basement at the opening and the way I don't know he's I know he's constantly 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 listening to music and I may be constantly saving like visual aesthetic material and then work work at it in my brain and that's kind of something that I'm just naturally drawn to doing so um, I also, and I'm a very, I, I like to be in the studio. I'm kind of, I like to make the things and chunk and kind of have the materials resist each other and then paint and then see that there is a little, there's a painting and a little part of another painting and then trying that and let, letting that kind of physical work develop my work in a way. So I guess... I think now I get, I do things that I wouldn't be able to, have been able to do a couple of years ago because I wouldn't dare to, because then, yeah, I just, the experience of painting makes, pushes the paintings forward or something. Do you make drawings or you just go ahead? It, it depends. I usually make sketches. It all depends. Sometimes I just go ahead and sometimes I, um, I have works that I started on three years ago that I think are like, hopeless paintings and and they're in the back of like a stack of paintings and suddenly when I'm doing this then I see this hopeless painting and it's not scary because it's but ugly and awful <laughs> and I can start to paint on that first if I and, that, and then and then that's a work that's suddenly included in this group of works so I, I quite like to save some works and then rework them so I have like inspiration from three years ago and stuff that I was interested in then and very new stuff. So like this, that painting is all super, like very new. It was the last piece I made. And some paintings here have parts of paintings from three years ago, like the little figurine on the left side there is uh, when I painted the glass sculptures and glass figurines. So.
Um, so, I would like to thank um, Christina Bechtle and Gadin Art Talk for uh, joining us, cooperating on this uh, uh, talk. Uh, I also would like to announce that there is some drinks downstairs at Schwarzes Cafe that um, uh, Christina and Gadin Art Talk and Presenhuber are offering to all of us. And uh, can we please have an applause for Ida? Thank you. Thank you.